All right. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here today. I really appreciate the um, the organizers for the invitation to be here and also the um, just the, the terrific seminars that y'all have been putting together over the past uh, past few months. Um, it's been it's been great. It's been nice to see good science and also to see the community building aspect of this all. Um, today, what I'd like to do is introduce a bit what my lab has been working on. Um, and uh, highlight that with, with one specific application. Um, in general, we are a single molecule fluorescence lab. So we develop new optical microscopy um, approaches to uh, see single molecules, to um, unveil uh, hidden heterogeneities, to look at motion and to look at localization. And um, you know, to make sure I don't forget to acknowledge that the people who do all this work, uh, this is my lab down here at the bottom, um, how, how we join together these days. So let me start by um, introducing to you the sorts of data that we're looking at to, to calibrate everyone. What I love about microscopy is that there's no leap of faith. The black and white pixelated uh, movie that you see on the top right is our raw data. And what you're always looking at in these kind of images are some pixel noise, some popcorn sort of looking noise. But then this white punctate spot that's moving across the screen, that's a single molecule. And what's great is that fluorescence has so much contrast that we could detect just one molecule. The red track is post-processing. And what I'm just showing you is that we can see how molecules are moving. We can see what is going on. Um, so to, to introduce the technology before I get to an application, um, many are familiar with this, but to make sure we're all on the same page, um, as I said, it's actually fairly straightforward to sensitively detect an image just a single molecule. What you're looking at over here is the image of a single dye molecule immobilized on a microscope cover slip. And it lets us start looking at one molecule at a time to uncover what's going on in mixtures. Um, what I think is also really exciting is that we're traditionally always sort of stuck with the resolution of, for example, a confocal microscope. We're always limited by the fact that light has that wavelength of about 300 nanometers. And so what you're looking at here, this blur, this, this punctate spot, that's a single molecule that's maybe a nanometer big. But when we look at it in the microscope, it looks to be um, blurred out. And that's if you go back to freshman physics, that's your airy function, right? That's just, that's just um, the, the, the two slit um, uh, experiment. So um, what's cool is that if we know about our microscope, we know what that interference pattern looks like. We know that this, this pattern is actually just an airy function. And we can fit our raw data. This is raw data here. And then this is a fit function there. And as a result, find the centroid or the center of mass of that image and really say where our molecule is. And what got me into this field um, coming out of a more bulk spectroscopy sort of perspective as a PhD student is the fact that because fluorescence has such good contrast, we can actually do this in more complex environments. And so this is the paper I read when I was finishing up my PhD. And this is uh, Soyan Kim in the Murner Lab, who was looking at uh, the same sort of punctate spot that I was showing you just before, but now that's inside a bacteria cell. If you kind of squinch up your eyes, you'll see that maybe there's, there's this crescent-shaped blur. But the cool thing is we could control the environment such that you can't see any background. And really what you're seeing is just a single fluorescent protein molecule inside that cell and do the same trick. Um, look at that data as an intensity profile and find the exact position of the single molecule. Finally, what completely blew my mind when I got into the field is the fact that this is just a frame in a movie. And if I play that movie, you can see that punctate spot doing a zigzag back and forth across the cell. And so this happens to be um, a cytoskeletal protein called MREB in, in uh, Colobacter. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about that, but I just think it really draws your eye to the idea that you can watch this molecule moving nanometers per second, very subtle motion inside what we used to think was just barely detectable, which is a single bacteria cell. So um, the 
final thing in terms of introduction that I'd like to draw your attention to is that this is all benchtop accessible technology. I love this image. Um, this is an image of, of um, my microscopy setup in the lab. Uh, it looks really fancy because uh, they've you know false colored the, the lasers. But when you think about what this setup is, this is all it is. We have a benchtop inverted microscope that looks sort of like something that many of us actually saw in a high school or introductory college uh, lab. This is just um, an optical microscope. We have a really good objective on it uh, because we want to collect all the photons possible. But otherwise, it really just is um, a, um, a non-automated uh, benchtop microscope. Um, our sample sits on the on the stage and then uh, we can sort of zoom in because all I care about in that microscope is that it's a really nicely engineered way to handle my sample and my objective. So what we're doing is always epifluorescence microscopy, which means that we send in our laser through the objective. We have our sample here on top of the objective and then we collect the emission back out. So now the only difference from that maybe high school uh, biology experiment is that instead of exciting our sample with white light or with an LED, we're using a laser. And the reason to use a laser is that it's monochromatic. And so we can really carefully filter out um, the excitation emission because imagine the contrast, right? You have a laser, even if it's a low power laser, and then you have just one molecule fluorescing. Um, our lasers are, uh, are, are small uh, CW lasers and the powers are like 10 to 100 milliwatts. So very low power lasers that we actually attenuate even further. And all the imaging is done. It's not scanning. It's all done in real time on an electron multiplying CCD camera. And I'm saying this not because this is anything we've invented. This is, this is how these experiments work. But just because what I love about this setup is that we have every component broken out on our table. And now I won't be able to talk about some of the things that we've done. But for example, if you want to look at the polarization of the emission, it's a single optic that lets you fix that and you can pop it in on the table. If you want two color imaging, it's just a couple extra dichroic filters that go into the setup. So it's very um, flexible technology. And also, um, like I'm saying, it's on the bench top so we could stick our samples, those live cells I was showing you, those can all be accessed without having to think about um, any kind of vacuum or temperature or any other control. So my lab thinks a lot about, like I was saying, right, what can we do given this, this technology? How can we make it better? How can we analyze our data better? How, how can we increase the scope of the, the images? And what can we do with sample preparation, of course? I won't have time today to tell you about it, but we do think a lot about the, the data processing. I'll, I'll kind of mention a few things. But if you're interested, um, we've gone to publishing all our code open source at GitHub. And um, for example, we have some nice code that does background subtraction, because again, um, we're looking at a signal to noise ratio of like four, five, these very small numbers. And so you really want to be as careful as you can be with your background. Um, I'll, I'll mention a bit today, but we also think in these complex trajectories, this data we get out, what could we learn from noisy, imperfect data? And we think about simulations to complement the experiments and, um, and also uh, analysis code to, to understand the measurements. Um, we do uh, several different types of applications. One side of my lab thinks about using metal particles as antennas to increase and affect the fluorescence. But today I really want to focus on our subcellular imaging in microbes. This has been really um, a passion project for me since I started my postdoc because um, I always thought that, that that bacteria cells were sort of uninteresting because I, I just had learned what they weren't. I learned, you know, bacteria cells have no membrane bound organelles, bacteria cells have no structure. And this really turns out not to be true. Uh, it's just that the methods and the applications were never exactly in tune. And so now with the idea that we can look inside the cell at how proteins, how nucleic acids are organized, um, it's really been very exciting for me. So the specific challenge that I'd like to use to highlight our work today is thinking about the molecular mechanisms behind nutrient acquisition in the human gut microbiome. And I say one and two, but interwoven into this, I, I wanna tell you about the tools that we need to use to understand the mechanisms inside these 
um, microbial cells. So let me introduce the system. Um, most of us have heard about the microbiome, either in the popular press or through our research. Um, microbiomes are just collections of bacteria that, that affect some function. Um, and in particular, the microbiome that, that I've been thinking about a lot is the human gut microbiome, which affects our ability to acquire nutrients and also is related to some sorts of inflammatory diseases. This is a great collaboration that um, uh, that has been underway for over 10 years since, since I started at the University of Michigan. Um, and I work together, um, my lab is a chemistry and biophysics lab. We work together with Professor Nicole Korpatkin in um, our med school, who is a structural biologist and also, um, also a microbiologist, microbio and Eric Martens, who is a microbiologist and a geneticist. So I love these interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, and in particular, Nicole and Eric have been thinking for a long time about a prominent human Human gut symbiont called Bacteroides theta iota omicron. So it's prominent in your gut and it's also the most well studied gut organism. And if you look at this, just this is just a cartoon of a bacteria cell. Um, when we think about a gram negative bacteria cell, we think about it having an inner membrane and then an outer membrane, maybe some external stuff. And let's zoom in on this red box. And so what you see if you zoom in, again, the cell inside the cytoplasm would be down here and the outside of the cell, its environment would be up here. So uh, this cell, we call it B theta for short, and it has on its outer membrane external to the cell, what's called the starch utilization system. And this is again, prototypical in that it is there, it is prominent, it is important in your gut, but it's also the most well studied um, um, polysaccharide utilization system. And so SUS is a collection of proteins that lives outside of the cell and then also throughout the cell. So these are all expressed on the same operon, which is, which is why they're, they're a, a locus or a system. Um, and in particular, I want to draw your attention to these five outer membrane proteins. They're very unique in that they're really sticking out outside the cell. And that makes sense because they're, they're trying to sense nutrients in the environment. And SUS is specifically attuned to bind amyloid pectin or starch, a specific type of, of carbohydrate linkage. So as a chemist, what I love is that these, um, there's about 70 different polysaccharide utilization systems in the, in, in the B theta cell that can be expressed in response to different sorts of nutrients. Um, and each one very specifically binds a different type of substrate. So um, we've been looking a lot at, at these proteins. And you know, the question that, that a chemist can bring in here using biophysical tools is really what is the mechanism here? How do these proteins work together to affect that sort of process of catabolism? So we began our studies by tracking SUSG, one of those outer membrane proteins. It's the enzymatic protein. So it's the one that's able to cleave the carbohydrate. And um, one thing we learned really quickly is that fluorescent proteins, many of us have heard of or even used GFP or other fluorescent protein analogs, those require an oxidation step in order to fluoresce and your gut has no oxygen. And so all of these cells are grown in the glove box in Nicole's lab and then we seal our samples and bring them out to the microscope. So no problem, we could do benchtop experiments. Actually, the cells are very happy sealed up because they don't want oxygen, but we can't use fluorescent proteins. So we've been using halo tags, which is just an enzymatic linkage system. We have our SUSG protein that Nicole has solved the crystal structure for. So we know exactly how to label it without affecting function. We also do functional assays. And we put on a halo tag protein that specifically recognizes this uh, halo tag ligand that has a dye attached. So if you look at the movie over on the left, this yellow outline is the cell and the white punctate spot is a single SUSG molecule labeled with a halo tag. And we can watch it as it moves around the cell. This protein um, has no purpose right now in that uh, the cells are living in glucose, which is a very simple sugar. Uh, it's not a substrate for SUSG. And so what I'm showing you right now is the baseline. How does SUSG move around the membrane? I know there's lots of membrane people in the audience that I'm always, um, I'm always amazed by you all because you know so much about this complex environment. In bacteria, um, and especially in B theta right now, the membrane is a bit of a black box. We could see from this motion 
that the membrane is fluid, but I, I actually don't know all the properties and it's something um, beyond this that I'm, I'm actually very interested in finding out. So the red post-processing, that's just my trajectory and the white, uh, black and white is the, the um, raw data. And so what you're looking at is SESG just moving around the surface. We call this the surveillance state, right? This is just SESG looking is there any carbohydrate? Is there some now? Is there some now? But it's not finding anything to bind to. We can analyze our data in different kinds of ways. These are the types of trajectories in the box marked A that come out of those uh, movies. And then in the box marked B, you could see that we fit the mean square displacement versus time lag for each trajectory to get what is the average diffusion coefficient of a molecule in each trajectory. Um, so this is our baseline. We see that many of the molecules are moving pretty liberally throughout the cell. Um, so then the question, of course, is what's the purpose? So let's introduce a substrate. Here, um, what, what my uh, former postdoc, Krish, has done is taken that CESG, which is labeled in red, like in the previous slide. She's also labeled the starch substrate in green. And what you're looking at, I actually want to unstart the movie. There we go. What you're looking at in this in this uh, image is a two color image. Uh, the 488 channel is a big starch glob that's stuck to the surface of the cell. And over on the right, again, we're going to be tracking the enzyme. So the position of the yellow arrow shows you the position of the starch and it's stuck in place um, throughout this movie. And then over on the right, what I want you to look for is towards the top of the cell, there's going to be some, some SESG that's moving freely like it was on the previous slide. At the bottom, there's some SESG that finds its target and stops moving. And so, for example, the blue trajectory near the yellow arrow on the right, that's a SESG molecule that's been immobilized at the position of the starch. The green trajectory that looks pretty diffuse, that's a SESG molecule that hasn't found a substrate. And now we start really seeing um, starch binding in real time. Again, we can analyze the data in many ways. Those mean square displacement curves show us that there's now in red a collection of trajectories that show pretty diffuse motion and a collection of trajectories that are flat. The longer you wait, it still doesn't move, which means that, that this is an immobilized molecule. Um, we've thought a lot about how to uh, understand this sort of data. Um, and I just wanted to illustrate a little bit of our thinking here, though, of course, with time, I won't get into all the details. Um, but basically, imagine, for example, one challenge we have, which is a molecule that moves pretty quickly and then binds its target. In that case, the average diffusion coefficient of the whole trajectory is, um, is not quite what we're looking for. So. Um, Another thing is that we see heterogeneous motion even within single trajectories. Um, and so what we want to analyze is what's the difference between binding and a random walk. And so um, we think a lot about not just single track um, measurements, but also single step measurements uh, using cumulative probability distribution of the step sizes. And the bottom line here is that we can really fit our step size distributions in order to get diffusion coefficients and get, if we have a long trajectory, the fact that here there's some slow and some fast motion even within a single trajectory. And uh, finally, something that we've really been moving towards is getting rid of supervisory bias while doing this. So curve fitting is great if we know what the model is and we have a lot of assumptions. If we don't though, what can we do? And I unfortunately won't have time to talk to you about it, but we've recently implemented um, some Bayesian statistics in a, in a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo um, algorithm that actually will um, eliminate the supervisory bias that the curve fit would entail, but still determine how many mobility states, like I said, is going fast or slow uh, uh, and what are the transitions between those two states. And so we call this smog for anyone who's a Lord of the Ring fan that's uh, the, the chiefest dragon. Um, but really what this is doing is using some statistical um, approaches to estimate the parameters, including are we going from fast to slow in real time? And then we could get at binding type of questions, um, uh, things that match biochemistry.
So um, to, to finish up my story, though, for today, um, you know, when we're thinking about this data, the question is, how do the sus proteins provide efficient glycan import? And so we see that the sus proteins move pretty freely. Uh, the sus G is moving pretty freely, uh, even in, in glucose where it has no substrate. Um, we see that if we add starch and we do this single step analysis, we go from having these two pretty fast uh, uh, diffusion coefficients to slightly slower. And we also change the, the relative weights between the fast and the slow motion. And so the cartoon version here is that as we go from a freely binding, pro, a freely moving protein to bound protein, we start to see that there is um, a slowing down and a cluster formation. And in experiments I won't have time to tell you about, we've knocked out D or C or E and F. And we found that those are all important to stabilize this complex that we really can't stabilize in vitro. We've also looked at some of the other proteins and for example, says G moves very freely, but an open mystery in my lab right now is why sus E and F don't. And so here you see G with those free trajectories. Here you see E and F that are stationary. And we've done all sorts of mutations, including deleting the capsule and the porin, and nothing makes E and F move. So I don't have a chemistry answer, but I have an evolutionary answer, which is that it seems like some of the proteins move quickly and some are fairly immobile. And we have this hypothesis that this must improve catabolism rate or cluster formation or assembly with the starch. And we're still trying to think about what that means because it, it's pretty baffling. Um, so let me uh, finish up for the last few minutes and tell you what's going on on the horizon. I just told you about SESG, which is the proteins on the surface of the cell that recognize uh, starch, uh, or amylopectin is a small subunit of starch, um, and uh, catabolize it and degrade it and produce glucose that your body actually could use. B-theta actually has 70 different types of polysaccharide utilization loci. And another example of one is pectic galactin. It's still a carbohydrate, but it has a different linkage between the polymers or polymer subunits. And uh, what uh, Teresa Rogers and Eric Martens lab found is that depending on what you grow your cells in, they can express the SUSG and the, the SUS system proteins, but they can also express the pectigalactin utilization proteins. And that was expected because we know B theta could grow in many different environments. What I thought was super cool from her work is that if we grow B theta cells in a mixture of amylopectin and pectigalactin, both of those um, polysaccharide utilization loci get transcribed. And you see both the red and the green uh, antibodies labeling. It's also known from other work, though, that galactin is prioritized over amylopectin. And so the question that, that Laurent is asking now is, does one glycan interfere with the ability to catabolize the other? Because we're wondering, does galactin suppress amylopectin binding? Or is it just easier to, to digest and that's why it's used first? And so um, this is ongoing work, but what he's basically found is that the pectic galactin, also the Levin uh, dynamics are similar to those of the SUS system. So it's a good prototype. And what I think is really cool, and we're, we're trying to make sure we nail it right down, is that it seems like adding galactin changes the dynamics of the amylopectin SUSG. And so there's something going on, some crosstalk, even though in vitro there is no binding. Finally, the last thing that we're, we're thinking about right now is that my lab has gotten really good at looking at one protein in one cell. And I start off by telling you we want to look at a microbiome. Uh, there's a pretty big disconnect between them. So Atmaja is really trying to think about community level interactions. For example, ruminococcus is a species that can eat things like potato starch, corn starch, rice starch that, that we can't, um, and degrades it into smaller soluble oligosaccharides that B theta can eat. And she's shown that, that there's crosstalk exists. 
But one problem we're having is that she's shown that the phenotype of the cells change with nutrient sources. And so here, for example, you see B theta, the bigger cells, ruminococcus, the smaller cells. What we'd like to do is really differentiate between the two of them uh, in, in a, a mixed environment. I told you we can't use fluorescent proteins. I've showed you the protein, the, the, the labels we've been using. We can't label a thick microbiome with, with these extrinsic dyes and these washing steps because we're going to disrupt this, the, the, the system. And so um, finally, Hannah has really been thinking about this problem. If we can't use fluorescent proteins, what are the other tools that are available? She wrote a nice review thinking about all these other types of labeling schemes other than GFP. And we finally settled on bill and binding fluorescent proteins like Unagi and IFP 2.0. And Hannah has shown that live cell anaerobic imaging is possible with these proteins. Basically, instead of the oxidation reaction, uh, these proteins take in a substrate. The substrates are, are um, are biocompatible substrates, they're non-toxic, and they seem to work and uh, allow us to differentiate between, for example, here, B theta and B ovatis. So we're really excited about all this work moving forward, um, and I'm happy to talk in more detail to anyone about, about any of this, uh, but let me end there and thank the people, especially um, Hannah, Laurent, Atmaja, Krish, and Hannah Tucson, whose work I've been showing, and thanks again for the invitation to be here. Okay, thank you very much, Julia, for that fantastic talk and also staying exactly on time. Um, we have uh, several questions in the chat. So I'll start with, um, with Robin Brinsma um, asking, how do you differentiate motion of the molecule and movement of the bacterium as a whole? Yeah, thanks, Robin. That's a really good question. And I actually um, deleted that, that image uh, for time, um, which is how do we make these samples? And what we've been doing is actually immobilizing our bacteria cells, but in, in the most gentle way we know. And so um, we have a, um, an agarose pad that has about 100 nanometer surface roughness. And then we put our cells on top and a glass cover slip on top of that. As a result, the cells are I think of them as sort of sandwiched in between the two, but they could still grow and divide. We could see that happening. So they're, they're still able to, to move a bit, but they're not able to jiggle or swim away. And we're also thinking about microfluidics, which other labs have implemented to, to stabilize cells in that way. Thank you. And we have a question from Suliana Manley. Um, did I understand right that you're doing spatially dependent background subtraction to take care of autofluorescence? And uh, can you say what your approach is and possibly point us to the code in the paper? Yeah, um, you know, the best place to find the code is on my GitHub site here. Um, and the paper is Isakoff et al. 2019 Biophysical Journal. Um, the main idea is that we are subtracting local backgrounds. Um, so rather than subtracting the whole image background or an average image background, we're subtracting a local background. And what we do is we differentiate in time. For example, if you have a um, dye molecule that's moving around and then it bleaches, we're looking for after it bleaches or before it gets photoactivated, we're looking for those frames in that space. And um, a question from Nancy Ford. Can you determine whether starch binding occurs before or after cluster formation? Which process is the trigger? Yeah, um, we haven't done, so the Nancy, the experiment that we're working toward is getting our cells into, for example, a microfluidic cell or something even more simple than that, where we can introduce the substrate and see an evolution in time. We haven't actually done that. So the reason I think that the cluster formation is starch mediated is that if there's no starch, we don't see, we, we see very transient cluster formation, but we don't see stable cluster formation. But then upon addition of starch, we see a lot of those clusters, but we don't actually have that time course that I think would be more satisfying. Okay, I think we have time for one last question, a background question from Meredith. Um, do the sus proteins break down the carbohydrates or mainly import them to, bro to be broken down in the cell? Oh, that's a great question that I that I went right by. Um, they do a bunch of those things. And so I'll finish by by going back to the start. Um, 
I know there's there's a classier way to skip slides. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, but basically what you see here in the protein, so it says E, F, and D, these bite-sized pieces, those are starch binding sites, so no, no uh, reactivity. SUSG has binding sites, but it also has enzymatic activity, and it breaks it down into smaller um, polysaccharides. Those are imported uh, through the porin, so the full starch definitely can't get through the porin. And then um, SUSB, uh, which exists in the periplasmic space, uh, is also able, or it, and it says A and B are also enzymatic, and those break them right down. They actually break them down to maltose, the disaccharide. And what's cool about that is SUSR is a regulatory protein that um, is induced uh, by the maltose uh, or, or senses the maltose in order to uh, affect induction of the SUS operon. So as soon as you start growing the cells in, for example, starch, and the maltose starts getting created, it upregulates production of the SUS locus.